and welcome back to another rousing edition of Spy Hard's Spy Master interview series. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And jumping onto the podcast this week, we have a very special interview for you. Uh, none other than David Franzoni. Now, Cam, tell the listeners a little bit about David. Yes, yeah, so David Franzoni is a Oscar winner. He produced the film Gladiator, which he also wrote. Um, he has a really interesting filmography that includes Amistad, as well as the King Arthur film from a handful of years ago, the one that starred Karen Knightley and Clive Owen. But his first credit, which you wouldn't necessarily connect to like historical epics like those, was Jumpin' Jack Flash, starring Whoopi Goldberg from 1986. You could say he was caught in a crossfire hurricane. You could. But you might not. <laughs> that's that's fair. <laughs> yeah, so we, we reached out to David and he was you know thrilled to jump on board and talk about this film. I don't think he gets many knocks on his door for the uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash story. Now, one thing we spoke about in the episode way back, it was episode 10 for us, is David wrote the story and has a uh, screenwriting credit on the film as well. But what his story was was not necessarily what ended up on the screen. Now, I don't want to foreshadow what's coming. I'll let David tell the story, and he does it better than I do. So what we'll do is we'll throw over to the interview right now. And joining us on the podcast is the writer of Jumpin' Jack Flash and some other films you might have heard of, you know, Gladiator. It is none other than David Franzoni. David, thank you for joining us. Uh, hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you here. This is a, uh, I think, really interesting movie to dive into, and we had a lot of fun recording our episode on Jumpin' Jack Flash, so I'm looking for as much insight as possible. Okay, well, I hope I don't let you down, but uh, yeah, it is an interesting script, so I'll let you throw the first ball. Go ahead. Sure. Well, when we have guests on, we generally like to set the scene a little bit, paint a picture of you. So before we maybe get to Jumpin' Jack Flash itself, how did you get into writing? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, ever since I was a kid, I was writing and all through college, I was writing, but it never occurred to me that I should be a writer, <laughs> I was actually a geology major. And, um, the moment that I sort of worked up the courage to make the decision to go to Los Angeles and duke it out, uh, was in 1973, I was on a motorcycle somewhere in India. And I decided, well, if I can do this, <laughs> I can do that. So that's how I sort of dropped everything and came out. Although the geology major stuff does play a bit in the Jumping Jack Flash. Okay. So Jumping Jack Flash rolls around in 86. But leading up to that, do you have any earlier kind of, I guess, flirtings with Hollywood with, in terms of writing screenplays? Like what is sort of the process towards leading into, um, you know, writing for Jack, uh, Jumping Jack Flash? Well, I mean, you know, I was out there for quite a number of years, um, you know, the archetypal starving writer mm -hmm. break in. The thing that people would say to me, people in the business would say to me is, you know, your premises and or your spec scripts are really intriguing, but we sort of don't know where to go with them. And I, that was the problem for Jumping Jack Flash as well. Um, I do think the solution is easier than they imagined. But, um, so I, I, I was encouraged by the fact that I was, you know, intriguing people at least. I had written a, a monster action picture that never got made. And that got me, it was about 1980-ish, that got me with CAA, which was, I think, just sort of forming anyway. But when I finished the action piece, I decided, well, I need to write something small. You know, I, read, I, need, to, I need to prove that I'm a writer, so I need to write a character-driven piece, action or not or whatever. So. I wrote uh, Jump and Jack Flash. And that's the one that sold and got made, obviously, uh, of, of the early pieces. Okay, so that brings us on to the origin of Jump and Jack Flash. Now, you have the screenplay uh, credit and story by credit on the film. So from what I've read, there's a definite transition from the original uh, idea you had to what came in the film. So. How did you go about writing that first Jump and Jack Flash story? And what was it about? All right, well, okay, so I'm a 60s guy, right? So, you know, it's got to be about something or I'm not doing it. So to me, what this era that I was living in, the 80s, 
it was about a, a confluence of vastly different visions or world visions. So let me explain. So my original hero, Jack, Jabba Jack Flash, was someone who had fought in the Congolese Wars. Got that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he was a radio operator fighting with mercenaries in the Congolese Wars. That's his, that's his, that's his origin story in the military. He then played into British intelligence and so forth. So what I wanted to do, and, and to me, the Congolese Wars were sort of the last great epic barbarian wars where you had these mercenaries who thought they were legionnaires and, you know, coming in to just take from the Africans and murder. And it, it was an, an era, the last of that sort of horrific, but very interesting era. And at the same time, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal was one of the, one, one of the newspapers that I always got. So Wall Street Journal and the Scientific American were my two Bibles. Because if shit was going on, it was going to be in both of those. And one of the things that was going on in an article I'd read in the Wall Street Journal was about bank encryption and relaying funds from bank, one bank to another, the times of nights they were doing it. And at that back in the day, those encryptions were pretty bulletproof. You know, God knows now. Hmm. But so we had this world of, you know, the sort of this, this ex-mercenary who had become a spy and the girl, you know, um, is, she works in a bank, right? I mean, she's not doing anything really extraordinary with her life, except she can handle the encryptions that can baffle and befuddle spies at that point. So she has this sort of weird position in life. So Terry, you know, and Terry has a lousy life. She's, you know, engaged in the wrong guy. Now, this is the original, of course. Um, you know, she has, you know, a, a cadre of friends who are questionable friends. You know, she's living the life that a lot of us live and with no way out. And one night, you know, Jumping Jack Flash lands and she begins this affair over encryption with this basically this barbarian. And Obviously, you know, the, 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 one, the one with Whoopi that they made steered quite a ways away from all that. Um, but that was the idea. The idea was these, you know, these huge movements and sort of the world were coming, were crashing together. And she was this innocent girl in the middle of it. Uh, there was a great scene, I, I, I don't believe they shot it, where she was, one night she's in bed with her boyfriend and she starts rattling off credit card numbers and, you know, she's, she'd been fed aminazine, which was a truth drug back then. It was used for cracking spies. Anyway, it was, it was a very complex sort of relationship that would not only just crash in on her, but then ultimately crash in like another second wave on her whole life, sweeping it all away and leaving her and Jack at the end. That was the idea. It doesn't sound like a story, but that was the idea. Well, that's really interesting because like what you described, um, it sounds, because obviously Jumpin' Jack Flash the movie is a, quite a broad comedy in a lot of places, right? And this sounds almost to me like it would have made more sense as something more akin to like Romancing the Stone, where you're balancing serious elements with comedy. Um, when you approach it, how did you imagine it? Because the final version is obviously, as I said, much more of a mainstream kind of broad comedy. Well, I mean, I'll be perfectly frank with you. I, I didn't have, um, you know, a touchstone. It has to be this. In fact, mm -hmm. after the studio bought it, and then after the studio sold it to another studio, I was meeting with every, you know, not every, but a lot of serious directors who were very interested in the project. And they would always ask me, but what is it? And I remember, I can't remember which director was with. I had the script in my lap and they said, what is it? And I handed it to him. I said, that's what it is. And the problem back then, not that necessarily different from today, is that without touchstones, people have a lot of trouble just sort of going forward. My point was, it is what it is. And if it's unique, that's probably better. And I can't pretend 
to solve the problems that you claim you have because I don't have those problems. And, you know, when they did the, in fact, the, the joke for me was I was in, actually I was in London later working with a French director uh, while he was shooting Half Moon Street. And um, my agent called me to say that they had signed with Lee Goldberg to Jumper Jack Flash. And I said, uh, okay, I said, that's great. It would be fantastic. But does that mean it's a comedy? And she said this or that or that. And, and I said, well, I'm not sure that it works as a comedy. And she says, she said something, well, they'll, they'll take care of that. They fixed everything else. <laughs> and I thought, okay, what does that mean? They fixed everything else. What that meant was they didn't really change a lot. They just yucked it up. Anyway, so um, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. No, you, you really much, yeah, very much so. Well, I suppose bouncing off of camera a little bit then, the original story as it, as it sat, was there any comedic elements to it or was it a straight spy story? Well, there was the case. There was some fun in it. She, Terry was, was quite fun. I mean, she wasn't Moby Goldberg, but she was quite fun. She had a great sense of humor, very smart. That's why she was able to, in the end, wrangle this whole spy thing down. Um, and she had, in the bank where she worked, there was a sort of menagerie of bank people that was quite fun, actually. In fact, someone said, well, what are you talking about? It was a comedy to begin with. I, I didn't think that, but, hmm. but it was quite fun. I think, however, the difference in tone uh, was, you know, substantial. Um, I mean, it's not that, see, that's why, okay, so the credits are, I have, you know, first screenplay credit and I have um, story by credit. The reason I have story by credit is because I created the story. But that means the guild recognized that the story hadn't been changed that much. Right. Or it was the same story, just funny. Although they take stuff out, which was, I'm not, I'm not being negative. I'm, I'm sort of not, you know, yeah, I, yeah. you know, it was a lot of fun, but um, I remember being in London, well, actually when I was in London uh, with Bob Swain, the guy who was doing Half Moon Street. I was at, you know, one night we were having dinner with Sigourney Weaver. And she said she remembered that script. Hmm. It hadn't been produced yet, but she remembered it and really liked it. Of course, because it was a very strong female character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, so that, that's how that, 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 it wasn't. It wasn't totally different. It was just totally different. Right. Okay. So I know that pre Whoopi Goldberg, it was seen as a potential Shelley Long film. Um, did you ever do passes of the script during the process of when you're writing the screenplay at any point, was that known to you? Like, were you ever writing it towards a specific actor? Uh, okay. So it was at a uh, lad company originally. And, um, I was working with a director there. The pro okay. So what I was trying to avoid was guy saves girl. You know, boyfriend saves this, you know, damsel in distress. And they kept pushing me that way. So ultimately, they replaced me with a female writer. Um, and I, I actually never saw that draft, but I understand it didn't work. They then sold it to Fox, where it got made. As, so I was never writing specifically for an actress. Okay. Well, before we uh, maybe analyze what the end result was a little bit, uh, you did touch on this boyfriend character that existed in your version of the story. Um, uh, looking at the character list now, and I actually rewatched the film just before coming on here, so it's quite it's quite vivid in my mind. Did that evolve into the Marty Phillips character played by Stephen Collins in the end? Was that uh, kind of how it was seen? Basically, yeah. I mean. Let's put it this way. I presume so. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Best I can do with that. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that they... Well, here, here was the issue. The issue was, okay, so I remember when I saw coverage from, I think it was MGM, and the coverage was like, you know, five-star. In the end, they said, you know, the ending was very moving and all that. The problem for people was, if it's a love story, we got to see the guy... They got to be together. They got to go, you know, get go to get submarine sandwiches together, whatever. They've got to have a life together. But my point was that it was more powerful if you didn't see him. If you, it's like radio drama. 
you know, you imagine, you know, you hear a Lone Ranger on the radio, you don't see anything. You just imagine what the Lone Ranger looks like. And I think that, I, I was very impressed. Did you ever see, um, oh, one of the early Vietnam War movies? Um, uh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I can't think of anything. It was really good. It's, uh, it had a lot of it. Um, it's probably, probably one of the, except for Platoon, it's probably the best. It had uh, a lot of radio drama. I'm sorry. I was just I'm going through the list here of the earlier. I mean, Apocalypse Now is earlier. Um, for that. Uh, boy, um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it was written by a, um, a Japanese or Chinese writer. He was also an actor in it. And I think it was Kurt Douglas, not Kurt Douglas. But anyway, there was a, you know, the actor they needed to get the show made. But anyway, there was, there was a, a, a Go Tell the Spartans. Okay. And it, it's really great. But this is radio. The end is totally radio drama, where they're attacked by the Viet Cong, and they're all killed, but all you see are muzzle flashes. Right. That's, that's all you see. And, the, and of course, it's terrifying because you don't see people falling over pretending they're dead. Mm -hmm. So the idea, I thought, well, you know, we can do this with, uh, with, with Terry and Flash. He, you know, we just don't have to see him. You know, he's there. And the way it was written, you felt his presence, I believe, throughout. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting because, you know, you use the term, you know, barbarian to describe the Jack character. I don't really think of Jonathan Price fitting that term right. so well. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jonathan Price is a bit more bondish. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it works in terms of what the movie is now, where it is sort of this more sort of sweet romantic comedy ending. But I, I do like the idea, as you said, um, having it more mysterious as to who this character was at the end. So then I have to ask the question. So if we don't meet Jack, uh, does your script end with her continuing on with the boyfriend who was established earlier? Oh, she meets Jack at the airport. Oh, okay. Uh... Now there's, there's, I, I, no, I, I dialed it, I dialed it a little bit. So in the original, uh, when she goes to his apartment, she, he gives her his address. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She, probably, she doesn't know who he is, right? I mean, obviously he could be anybody. So she goes to his apartment, she finds some photographs from the Congolese Wars. And there's one of this guy with a radio in his arm running away with an arrow pointing at it saying, me. Oh. You feel like, okay, so he's not a murderer. He's, he's, you know, he's a radio operator. He's a communications guy, just like he is now when she finds it. But he was in this barbarian war. And so, you know, we, it, it gives him, you know, obviously it gives him a pass. It gives him a reality. So that was very important to me was that scene. Anyway, so he sees him at the airport. He, yeah, he arrives and they, they know who each other are. Gotcha. I suppose if we're talking about Jonathan Price and uh, as, as Cam alluded to, it's a bit of a strange choice for, for us uh, choosing and seeing him at the end of the film was a bit of a surprise. But did you have someone in mind actor wise who you would have cast it may be in your version of the story so not to say anything about what came out in the end but in your version of the story an actor of the time who would you think would suit the role you mean for flash correct uh you know i'm sure i probably did um i mean we're talking about a different era now um i mean here, here, here was the problem okay so yeah sure you want steve mcqueen or somebody but you can't do that because he's not in the movie mm -hmm just what he's typing and maybe sometimes saying. So I don't know, I, we, we, we discussed it and it was the idea that we needed somebody so that when you saw him, your fantasies were fulfilled. Yeah. Just the right. way Terry's were. So it's like, that's gotta be him. Right. right. That's as far as we went with it. Okay, so um, the whole tying it around the song, Jumpin' Jack Flash. Now, was that there from the earliest versions or was that something that came later? You say you're a 60s guy, so it kind of makes sense if that was the case. Where did that all start to tie into the story? No, I, I, I gave him a code name, Jumpin' Jack Flash. Okay. Period. I mean, I, I, I didn't use it as a, originally as a title because I figured I would be sued by the Rolling Stones or something. <laughs> but sure. that, that was, his, that was his, his code name. 
And I assume that was obviously in reference to the, the Stones song, but it was at the end of it in your script, there was the code name, there was no featuring of the song in your mind or anything like that. No. Or, or, or Aretha Franklin covering it for your film as well. Did, did you ever see the rock video that came out of it? For Aretha? Oh, I did, yes. With, with Aretha, and I think it was Keith. Yeah, that yeah. was fantastic. Aretha Franklin, I mean, my God, it's fantastic. Singing Jumping Jack Flash. And I made yeah. it happen, are you kidding me? That's great. <laughs> Well, I suppose then, now we've looked at the story originally, and we're now moving on to the film itself, and what came and what was put out there. <laughs> Did you ever see the finished product in, in the theatres or on home release or anything like that? Yeah, of course, I went to the premiere. Right. Um, so obviously you said it was handed over to Fox, I think at one point towards the end. They were the, the people that run it. Was it MGM, you just said? Who bought it in the end and made the film? I think it was Fox that bought it. After that point, were you still involved in the production? Were you around when they were shooting it? I was, or had you handed it off? Two writers came in to write it funny. And uh, I was, like I guess I was in London working with a French director while he was trying to write with him while he was directing uh, Half Moon Street. Okay. Now, I know the original director was uh, Howard Zeef. Did you collaborate much with him or did it get you know once he came on board was it even then kind of passed on to other writers uh it, it was uh, you know no i didn't i didn't collaborate well, look when i had my right my director's meetings at fox i think they were found to be a bit artsy or something you know mm -hmm. and um they, 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 they you know they wanted to find a way forward I wasn't giving them that, of course I was, but they didn't like that idea. And so there, you know, some, I, can, I can only imagine somebody saying, hey, some, Terry's pretty funny, why don't we make it a comedy? So that, that's only I got that. I was not involved. Right. Okay. Um, I suppose the last question I have for Jumpin' Jack Flash itself is, why a spy story? What made you want to go down that genre, in that, that, that area of, of storytelling? Well, again, of course, it's not a spy story, the original script. It's a story about this girl. Okay. And she's uh, possibly going insane in this late night job she has at the bank. Because the audience, there are clues for the audience to doubt her. And, um, and everybody, when she starts rambling off serial numbers for credit card, her boyfriend thinks she's lost her mind. And somebody, I can't remember who, somebody figures out what's going on. That she's not, she hasn't lost her mind. It, it, that's resolved that it's, you know, it's the truth. But it's not, it's not strictly a spy story. It's um, a story about this, the coming of age of this girl. She's trying to find, I hate the, the term coming of age, but she's trying to find her way in this bizarre world. And, um, and she, you know, finds it by saving a spy. What I'm glad to hear is in your version of the story, there was no scene with Whoopi Goldberg biting the uh, private parts of John Wood. That, that's the main thing I'm taking away from this. And I'm happy for that. No. <laughs> well, I, I am curious. You know, Scott brings up that example of a moment within the movie. But when you saw the finished film, obviously it went much more, as you know, we said, mainstream comedy. You've got Whoopi Goldberg as the lead. That's going to shift the tone in terms of what you originally intended. I'm curious when you watch the movie outside of the premise, if there was moments or scenes you can recall that felt like your original vision of what this was? Well, when, uh, mainly when she was on her own. Mm -hmm. it, when she tries to break into the embassy, that sort of thing where she has to take on the responsibility of a spy or something. She has to become the spy to save the spy. The moments where she is trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Those to me are like, yeah, those are from my script. That, that was what the script was about. You know, it's like, it's, we're trying to figure out what the hell's going on in this room late at night at this bank with this crazy son of a bitch communicating with her through fucking bank codes. But it's, it's about us. It's about, we're trying, it's about like, what's life? You know, she's a young girl. She's out of college. She's trying to figure out what to do with her life. And, you know, so we, we put a, we lay a heavy metaphor on that and we have a jumping jack flash. Right. If you will. Um, well, after Jumping Jack Flash, there's some other films that pop up that I mentioned earlier on. 
Uh, I know Cam wanted, uh, well, I mean, the two that spring to mind for me are Armistad and Gladiator are the two films. I mean, I've got some questions about Gladiator, but I know Amistad came first and Cam has a few lined up for that. Yeah, I was really curious because this is such an interesting point where Spielberg is doing that two movies at the same time kind of thing like he did with Jurassic Park and Schindler's List. And then now we have The Lost World and Amistad. I'm curious what sort of his involvement was even able to be during the process. Like, was this a script you'd been developing on your own for a while that he got attached to? How did that sort of work? Okay. Um, right. So uh, I had recently written um, America Castro Street, uh, the Harvey Milk story, uh, oh, yeah. Oliver Stone. And so everyone liked it, period. They just, everyone liked it. So I was hot. And my agents came to me. They went like, Sly wants to meet with you. Arnie wants to meet with you. You know, you know. I'm thinking, well, what am I going to write for them? Anyway, so, um, but at the same time, an executive from Quincy Jones Company had lunch with me and said, look, Quincy has all these ideas. And so we ran through them. They're basically all about angry vinyl, right? I mean, you know, stealing songs, whatever. I mean, it, was, it was okay, but I mean, and the last one she brought up was Amistad. And I remembered, oh, yeah, I know the Amistad story. So I said, well, look, let's do this. Let's put a pitch together and we'll take it to Quincy. So we did, and Quincy basically, you know, he said, no, I don't want to do this. This is, you know, it's, and he says, he didn't, he says, it's going to make blacks look bad. Where'd you get this stupid idea? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but and I said, well, it came from you guys. I mean, you pitched it to me. Mm -hmm. He said, no, I don't want to do it. So by, by that time, I was hooked. I wanted to do it, period. So, um, began working on it on my own. Um, anyway, while that was all going on, Amblin was, you know, creating DreamWorks or however that worked. And I went in for a meeting with Walter Parks at DreamWorks and they, they pitched me two things. One was a sci-fi idea, which wasn't bad, by the way. I keep, you know. Hmm. And he, and the quote was, now, David, I want to pitch you. See, he asked me, because I also done George Washington for all of this. And it was, it's a pretty good script. And he said, um, are you sick of period? And I, I said, no, no, no. He said, I'm going to pitch something to you you've never heard. Amistad. And I said, well, you know, over at Warner Brothers pitching this right now. To... Anyway, so the bottom line was, and that was Stephen. And it wasn't that I was developing the script on my own. It's that I was solving problems on my own. Like, again, I didn't want it to, any more than I wanted to be guy saves girl. I didn't want white guy saves black guy. That yeah. was the most important thing, no. So I'd worked this thing out and I, and I, I pitched it to Stephen that, you know, Sing King has to handle his own, has to be in, like seriously involved with this case. He's gotta be, you know, where he, Debbie Allen gave me this idea of when, when a, you know, um, Benin, uh, Benin is, in, is in trouble, they call down their ancestors. So that's why I said, well, let's, let's, let's have John Quincy Adams call down the ancestors at the Supreme Court. And anyway, we, it, was, it was really great. It was a, which, once I got going with Stephen, it was like, you know, Debbie and I are meeting after our meetings with Stephen. We're talking about the civil rights movement, about the 60s guy, this is great. It was this wonderful experience with Stephen, who completely embraced the project without any kind of hesitation. And... Um, so I went off and wrote the script, and um, anyway, uh, yeah, he was juggling two movies, I don't know, maybe five, I don't know, he, hmm. but he made it, and uh, he did, uh, I thought, a fantastic job. Now, you touched on uh, Debbie Allen, the producer, and I know, you know, there was a letter back in 97, I believe you wrote for the LA Times, just about her involvement in the writing process, and I was just curious um, what hand she played in helping you along with the script. Well, I mean, I look... Here's something, what's important about Amistad or, you know, even like, if you look at Jimmy J. Flash, right? So Flash, I had, Flash had to have a life. He couldn't just be this cute guy who beams down at the end of the movie. So he was in the Congolese Wars. He'd obviously experienced, like somebody like beat up. So I thought, okay, so what's, the, what's Sinke's life? You know, who is he? Now, and so Debbie and I used to sit and talk about that. She was, 
but she, what she knew is that she knew and the cultures in depth. She knew the Benin culture in depth. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Like for instance, calling down the uh, the ancestors when you're in trouble. She knew all that, and so I, we would just sit there and and talk. Mm -hmm. The world, who these people were, the difference between a freed slave, someone who was never a slave, freed slave who became an abolitionist. We wanted to make sure that there were some subtle distinctions. Also, <clears throat> what was important to me and what I read at the time was, of course, there was a lot of pressure being brought by the government on the courts to just let the Spanish have them and fuck it, right? And there was one judge, and this is, this is, this is why when you get into the, the, the granular nature of these pieces, things really start to resonate. There was one judge who was a Catholic, mm -hmm. but he had to keep it secret. Because everybody hated Catholics back then. Catholics were the Antichrist. And so they basically threatened, the, the government threatened to reveal him as a devout Catholic and the Antichrist and all this. And I have the scene where he goes in and he prays by himself one night. Now, Catholics didn't believe that you could, like a Protestant, that you could go into a quiet room and pray. It was more like you had to go to church and enter interact with God and so forth, but he's by himself praying. And to me, those are the scenes that, and also the other stuff that we got into was the philosophical differences between the South and the North. I think it was Hobbes who believed that mankind was perpetually evil. It's sort of like the Republicans today, right? Hmm. Mankind is evil. And they, Hobbes you wrote, you know, the, the natural case of the natural state of mankind is slavery and those who eat them. I mean, that was the, the basic position of the South and the Republicans right now. I mean, we're repeating ourselves. Mm -hmm. The North, you know, they look, they read Rousseau, you know, they, the, 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 you know the, the social contract, you know, it was like, it was a different world. So I tried to bring those together too, and with John, using John Quincy Adams as the mouthpiece of and, and Quincy Adams said something that what I really believe strongly, which is if there's going to be a civil war, let it come and let it be the last battle of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. I'm working on, I'm starting to work on a piece right now for a French company on Lafayette. And the way blacks have been written and rewritten and written out of American history is disgraceful. So I have this letter from a German mercenary who was fighting with the French. And he wasn't, he wasn't a, you know, a, a Hessian, he was a regular German. And he was at the Battle of Yorktown, where Cornwallis surrendered, right? And he wrote this letter describing Washington's troops as being 25% black. So where do you see that? In any portrayal of the American Revolution, very paintings, right? No, nowhere. Mm -hmm. I have to go back to your original sources. And... You know, so I, I felt very strong, I still feel very strongly that the Civil War was the last battle of the American Revolution. Right. And the South, especially Virginia, was, was, was England. Classist, right. racist, I mean, you know, but it, that's one of the reasons why at the end of the American Revolution we outlawed titles. Like Steven Spielberg was benighted, but he can't use sir here. We don't do that. Anyway, so, so. Well, I'm really interested because when I look at your work of the produced films, they, for the most part, have very, very clear protagonists, whether it's Maximus in Gladiator, whether it's even uh, Citizen Cone, you know, the James Woods character in that film. Um, whereas this film, you know, you want to base it around Cinque, as you said. I'm just curious, in terms of telling that story there's so many moving parts with so many characters how you maintain that focus while trying to be true to history um just the challenges of writing that well <clears throat> there was stuff that was taken out um but i think the, and I, but i think it still worked i think i still it, it focused on sinki i think okay for instance when i wrote the scene on the amistad where sinki pulls the nail out of the deck after that scene you remember him. He's not like, you know, don't hit me, master. It's like, I'm going to kill all you motherfuckers, right? Mm -hmm. I think that 
that that weighed a lot, and it also weighed heavily when he starts getting involved with John Quincy Adams, because John Quincy Adams, the former president, he's you know erudite. Uh, he represents sort of a uh, an ecclesiastical version of the American dream, but he's got guts, and so they echo, I, they mirror each other. That was the idea that those two would, rather than John Quincy Adams going, "I'm going to save you, poor black guy." They mirror each other. That was the idea that they re, that they echo each other. If that right. is. No, yeah, for sure. Okay, well, maybe Scott, do you want to move over to a gladiator question? Yeah, I suppose Gladiator for me, um, it was one of those films that came out in 2000. I, I didn't see it at the cinema. I don't think I was quite the age to see it, but I, it was one of the first DVDs I ever bought. Um, one of my favorite films of all time. So thank you for that. In terms of a question, my first one is, how did you get involved with the film? I know it's quite a, a easy question's been asked many times before, but I'm really curious to know how you went from, you know, Jumping Jack Flash to Armistad to a Gladiator film. No, the Gladiator was first. I, I, in the 70s, I drove from West Berlin on a motorcycle to Australia. While I was in Baghdad, so leaving the West, going through Eurasia, you know, Turkey, basically, Romania, there's coliseums everywhere. I mean, they're not but they're everywhere. So I suddenly realized, holy shit, this must have been, this is a huge franchise. This isn't just something happening in Rome or Pompeii. This was everywhere. And then when I was in Baghdad, camped out on, I can't remember which river, uh, I traded a book on the Irish Revolution for a book from an Australian girl for a book called Those About to Die. And those about to die, which I give credit to as you know, being a, an inspiration for Gladiator, wasn't so much that it was literally Gladiator. What it did was it completely, in the synopsis in my mind, bridged who they were and who, who we are. So it was clearly, this was, so when I, when I pitched it to Stephen, the actor I did Amistad, so finally I get back to, I swear to God that when I was in Baghdad, if I ever became a screenwriter, I worked like hell to get that minute of the movie. What I said to Stephen was, this isn't about ancient Rome. This is about Los Angeles, 2,000 years from now. CAA represents the gladiators. You know, as I, you know uh, Ted Turner is Commodus. Um, you know, I just, that, that was how I laid it out. And, and I, you know, Ridley got that, I think, really well. You know, so, the, I, so I, I had this idea in my head for a long time. Well, it's interesting because I remember so much of the talk when Gladiator came out about how it very much revived an older form of Hollywood storytelling. When you look back at movies like Ben-Hur or Quo Vadis or so many of those films. Um, I'm curious when you were writing the film, if there was tropes you were trying to avoid in terms of bringing it up to date, making it feel you know modern for its time. Yeah, well, that was the idea, of course. See, I think that take was incorrect. This is a modern film. Um, now, we, we, look, we spent a lot of, uh, uh, I was on for all, like 90% of the shit. So we would spend a lot of time, Ridley and I and Russell, we spent a lot of time talking about what this movie was. And, you know, I, I wrote a line, you know, that uh, for, for uh, 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 what's his name, the, the Oliver Reed character, uh, Proximo where he says, I'm an entertainer or not. It started out as I'm an entertainer. And once that was in there, everyone sort of got it. That this wasn't, you know, one of those craggy old movies from the 50s. This was about who we are and will become. And um, so avoiding, you know, we didn't, okay. So the movies that Ridley and I talked about and looked at were La Dolce Vita, obviously from the beginning, All Quiet on the Western Front. Yep. And uh, The Conformist by Bertolucci. Those are the movies. Not Ben-Hur, blah, 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 blah. The problem with those movies, the, one of the big problems with those movies, and which we specifically said we were going to avoid, was religion. Because if we show Jews or Christians being abused in the arena or whatever, then the audience takes their side. But if they didn't have that choice, they had to be 
friggin' barbarians sitting in the Colosseum seats cheering on. They had to go there. That, that then, and they did. So it was, yeah, we avoided that stuff, but we didn't. It wasn't that hard. Okay. I was just, I was just thinking about your answer there uh, with the religion. It's interesting because obviously. Maximus does have visions of of going to what I assume he thinks is heaven, where his family is and things like that. So there is that religious undertone through the film. Is, is that yeah, is but that conscious thing, or is that just is that just how you interpret it as a me no, potentially as a, as a viewer? No, I don't. I think it's okay that there's an afterlife. Like like okay, so the original Ben Hur, you know, the fa- like you know, what's his face comes back, you know, like okay, so he comes back from the wars and the chariots and you know whatever comes home and everybody's got you know leprosy or whatever the hell they got and so the audience is going oh my god it's going to get sad ending but then christ shows up and cures them all that we didn't want that kind of religion mm. we didn't want an identifiable form of religion so maximus has his um the statues of his ancestors all the statues of his ancestors that uh you know that the jaiman buries in the arena after his death and this is really great. Like Ridley and I called it his long distance phone call to his family. Because you have that scene where he's getting ready to retire, he's coming home, and he's got his ancestors, and then we see his family. Mm-hmm. Made no sense at all. But that's too bad. And, you know, and so in the afterlife, he goes to the pagan afterlife. That's fine. Right. <laughs> it's, why not? Well, I'm curious, you know, you talk about working with Ridley Scott so closely. Um, Ridley Scott is so often identified as one of the most important visual storytellers of his time. I'm really curious, from your point of view, how he is in terms of a story expert, because you don't hear people talk as much about Ridley uh, Scott in terms of being a storyteller. I'm, I'm just curious, you know, developing that story with him. Okay, so with Ridley, this it took me a while to understand this. So, okay, sometimes when you have something in mind for a story, like the subtext that we have, like, look, Maximus's story is very straightforward. It's not a revenge movie, which a lot of people say, so it's a Clint Eastwood revenge movie. It's not. This is a man who refuses, who is working his life to protect the empire, and then when Marcus Aurelius dies, he refuses to take the responsibility of running it. So now he's forced to live the underbelly of that empire, which he doesn't know. And his, all he wants to do is get home. He's not trying to get even with anybody. It just so happens the way it's designed, getting even is getting home. So the, the, the whole subtext of what this was about, that's why we were talking about La Dolce Vita and, and the conformist rather than Ben-Hur, is something that, and I'm only talking about the experience I had, something that really clearly saw and then made sure the visuals echoed what we were trying to do. So as a storyteller, you know, it is, is a Van Gogh a storyteller? I think so. I mean, it's, it's a different medium, but he's a storyteller with his visuals, which are brilliant. He's like probably the greatest visual director of all time. Mm-hmm. He's amazing to work with, amazing, nothing. Like we were down in the um, provincial arena set which was at a Wazazat, which is in the middle of freaking nowhere, right? And he's got, he's got like five or six cameras. Really, you know, he can do like 30 cameras or whatever. He just doesn't, it's his medium, it's his paintbrush, right? So he, we're watching this sequence going on with the provincial gladiators, and he, he laughs, he calls me over to a monitor, and there's uh, Oliver Reed standing there with a cigarette in his mouth, sure enough, right? <laughs> you know, Ridley's not gonna throw a tantrum, he thought it was hilarious. And it was like there was that good, solid, I know where we're going, I know what we're doing. There's nothing to worry about feeling for everyone on that set because of Ridley. Right. I suppose the only thing that jumps out for me to ask in terms of Gladiator Left is, it seems like this is one of the pieces of work that you were most involved with from conception to creation. Right. Is there a particular moment, looking back on it now, that you were proud of in the film? Like Something you point to as maybe the thing you were most involved with? Well, okay, so, <clears throat> I mean, look, it's, it's there, there were, okay, I was rewritten, and, okay, so, and there were some issues with the rewrite, 
Now, I'm not blaming the writer, actually. It was not his fault. But then, in fact, he, he sent me an email from London saying, look, when you're over here, let's sit down and go through this. Very generous, open. And, and I was a producer because, of course, I created it. So, it was, I was a producer. so they, they couldn't actually get rid of me, right? It's like, no matter how you try, you can't get rid of me. So, so I remember we met. Okay, this, well. Okay, part of the dynamic of the problem with the draft was, and it was, it was very hard to sort of see, was that Russell had inadvertently been written out of the script, even though he was in every scene. And I said this, and everyone went, no, you're wrong, it's, it's perfect, we're, you know, we're all set to go. And then, you know, during the read-through, Russell brought that up. He said, look, I've been written out of the script. And what it was was, that you have to remember, so Russell is in the provinces, Commodus is in Rome. So what you want is the shit to hit the fan after Russell, after Maximus comes to Rome. And basically until that moment, everything is smooth sailing for Commodus. What they had done was they started the whole rebellion against Commodus before Russell arrived. So the, the point was, and Russell, and, uh, yeah, Russell, Russell was correct, why am I here? Why am I in the movie if I'm not pushing the revolution, which was correct. It wasn't a big change, but it was important. So uh, you know, yeah, I was you know, happy that that got done. And uh, then, I, you know, I mean, I don't know. The whole process was great. I, you know, I, we, we go after he got through shooting at the Wazazad Hotel, we go have dinner, smoke cigars, drink whiskey, talk about the next day's shooting, because we would have shot this in, in, in order because he was worried about the script. I go back to my room where my family was like, they were cashed out, work on the script, give it to them at three in the morning, and off they go. I, I, just, I, loved, I loved it. It was fantastic. Well, you mentioned Commodus um, a couple times there, and that's something that I always really appreciate in a movie is a very well-written antagonist. And he became an iconic one that people still reference. I'm just curious from you, your sort of thoughts on writing really strong antagonists. So like what are, what's, what's necessary? Well, the, the, the basically, and look, you know, you know, I wasn't the only writer working on the script. So you know, John Logan was on it. But however, nevertheless, the character as well, you know, I, I, like I created the character. And the character had to be essentially to be as strong a villain as he was, the mirror image of everything Maximus wasn't. Or the mirror image of, of Maximus. You know, it's like, you know, he had to be somebody who almost, you know, psychologically had to just be a motherfucker because his nemesis Maximus was so beloved. And so now that's, I think that's the essential basic foundations for having a great villain. Everybody says, you, in order to have a great hero, you got to have a great villain. Well, you know, that it works the other way around, too. you got to have a great hero in order for there to be room for a great villain. But I think also that what made Joaquin's character so strong was that, now, remind you, the only work, historical work we have to go on is the Augustan histories. That, that's basically all. And that's been deemed mendacious. So we probably don't really know who the hell communist really was, right? But there's a great quote from uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry Saint in Wind, Sand, and Stars, where he describes storytelling as a stone washed up on a beach, that over the centuries it'll become smoother and more perfect. And, you know, so communist over the centuries, whoever he really was, was smoother and more perfect a villain than he ever probably really was. And so we're the beneficiaries of receiving that wonderful stone that he had become. And he was somebody who was going to do whatever the fuck he wanted with Rome. He didn't want to hear about the barbarian front. He didn't want to hear about defending this or that. He just wanted to basically live a life of luxury. It's, you know, and, and it was a very Donald Trump you know, thing. And rule over those people who didn't understand what the hell was going on. And that was his domain. And into that domain comes Maximus, who not only is his antagonist, but he's the, becomes the hero 
of the machine that keeps Maximus in power. So now he's got a problem. He can't kill Maximus because he'll destroy the machine that keeps him in power. And that was how that worked. So, you know, that was the sort of mechanic. Look, this was like the hero, the characters have to emerge. The story has to emerge from character. You don't go through writing a story. I never outlined. You go through and you write the character. And then everything starts making sense. You know? mm -hmm. So I had um, just one question I really had about King Arthur. Um, I thought was King Arthur was a really interesting attempt to kind of update the Arthurian legend. It didn't really connect with, you know, audiences, maybe like it should have. I'm just curious for you if it felt like that movie was just like missing some sort of spark that like say Gladiator had where like kind of where did it not quite go right? Okay, the original, when I was first talking to Jerry Bruckheimer about this, the original, and Mike Stenson and Chad Alban, the whole crowd, right? The original idea was, this is the fall of Vietnam. The, the, you know, the, the NVA and the Viet Cong are moving south. A special forces unit is sent north above the DMZ to rescue a family or you know, these people and bring them back. You know, Merlin is Ho Chi Minh. Um, you know, the, his fighters are the Viet Cong. That was the idea. It was supposed to be a big little story, not overblown. Like, I think it just got, it got out, of, out of control. And we lost sight of, because in the original script, there was a scene where they were hating each other, hating on each other. And that got taken out. And I think it was important that that scene be in there because that scene was the one that defined their relationship. Also, whether you, I'm not sure you know this, but there really was a Lucius Artorius Castus. Hmm. And he probably was the basis for King Arthur. And so we, there's a new book coming out by John Matthews and Linda Malcor um, about that. Well, for instance, we were taken to court because we said, we had the audacity, to, the audacity to say that this is probably where Arthur came from. So I had to give all my research, which was actually everybody else's research, you know, Linda Malcor and uh, Littleton and everybody else, give that to the court. I'm, I'm not making this up, right? Yeah. It, it sounds like us, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. And they found for us, which pissed them off even more, right? It's like, they said, no, I, this makes total sense where this could come from. Look, Avalon, when Arthur goes probably to die at the end of the Arturian legends, where the great Roman officers were sent in Italy to be cured, cured was Avalonia. I mean, every, of, of, of the 11 uh, uh, battles that Arthur is supposed to have fought, 10 can be traced back to Lucius Artorius Castus. I mean, this wasn't just idle fantasy. The Sarmatians, okay, this is, this is the fun part. So the battle in uh, Vindabonia and in Vienna at the beginning of Gladiator, at that battle, a, a force of Sarmatian cavalry was taken prisoner. One part of it was sent to Egypt, and we never know what happened to them, and the other was sent to England, to the UK, with Lucius Artorius Castor as their commander. And they lived there for over a hundred years, not obviously with Lucius, as a separate social entity they were unique unto themselves and the sword in the stone is sarmatian um the the um you know the, the grail right the goblet well there is a goblet in sarmatian history which was always being hunted and always desired because it was full of opium so it's like you can you can say well it, it, that's a coincidence but i find that hard to buy that that's a coincidence. There's a lot more to it. Um, hmm. There's the, the King Arthur, who was a literary conceit, a literary concept, which is completely separate. We're just talking about historical bones. So what I thought was, okay, we have this guy. He's a British commander. I mean, a, a Roman commander. He wants to get the hell out of there. You know, England is falling. The soldiers are retreating. He's got one last mission. He has to go north of the DMZ, fight the Viet Cong, bring back this family. But what happens is, you know, he meets Guinevere and he becomes, he becomes an indigenous English fighter himself. That was the original idea. 
Interesting. Interesting. Now, Scott, do you want to jump over to some of our spy related topics? Absolutely. Um, before we, we wrap up with the spy questions, I, when I do my research for this, I always look through IMDb. And one thing that jumped out to me is Gladiator 2. Yeah. Mm. It, uh, you're down as a, as a producer for this. It says announced apart from that. I mean, do you have any information on that? I know there's probably embargo over contracts everywhere. You can say anything, but is it, is it still in production somewhere or? I, I, I don't think about it. I mean, I'm a producer because I create it. So mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to just keep me off. I've been offered money to go away. Um, I don't think about it. I look, I'm sure that there's, there's a lot of talented people working on it. I'm sure whatever they're doing is, is terrific, but I don't know what it is. I, I don't know how you follow up on Gladiator personally. I, I don't understand that, but that's just me. I don't make films. Tell me they're re remaking Seven Samurai right now. Yeah. Really? That's uh, uh, let's not get into remakes i'll be here all day um well we always wrap up our interviews with some questions about spy movies because that's what we talk about every week so the first question i always ask is what is your favorite spy movie uh, 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 well i have two levels of that okay i'm a huge fan of early bond from Rush with Love, Goldfinger, Dr. No. Those are just obscene fun. And yet, they do manage to capture some of the feel of the espionage. And that's because, of course, of who wrote the books. And, um, but as far as more serious fare goes, um, again, they're from books. Uh, my two favorite are. Uh, Smiley's People and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy with uh, Ellen Gillis. Okay, now I think you probably um, answered this question already, but you would say that after you know fifty plus years of James Bond, that Sean Connery is your Bond, right? Yeah, I mean, um, look, I know Pierce; he's great. Um, the thing about Sean Connery was that he just look; he had this ironic attitude which always said, I don't believe I'm in this ridiculous movie, but let's just do it. You know, there was something magnificently ironic about his attitude that none of the others have actually captured. That, that's why I love it. Yeah, we're big fans of him as well. Yeah. I suppose spinning off of that because you are a writer, if they say now after this most recent Bond film that's coming out potentially in a few months' time that they want to do something different with the franchise, say they called you up and said, what should we do next? What would be your idea and where would you take the Bond franchise moving forward? Well, I would definitely go in the direction of Smiley's People or Take a Tale of we, We've got the circus. I mean, they always have a bit of the circus in the Bond films. But let's face it, <clears throat> the biggest problems for MI6 and MI5 back in the day were themselves. Mm -hmm. I would... I would go, I would go there. I mean, I would, there's a project I'm working on with Mike Metavoy right now at a and &E called the Ossenberg File. And Ossenberg was a clerk, a cleric, and was a clerk who stood between wackos and Hitler. Hmm. And what he would do is like, so if you're Werner von Braun and you want money for your V1 idea, you go to Ossenberg. He would then submit the proposal to Hitler, get approvals and pay him. So by the end of the war, he had everybody on there, right? People who are insane, people who are dangerous, people who you wanted. So there is a, there, it's slightly retro rather than today, or it could be today. I'm just put it this way. It could very well be today, but you could take those old attitudes and put them in today. You know, the secretaries who are keeping things from you, um, which they kind of did with Bond, you know, with Money Penny, but you know, other members of your own uh, organization who are lying to you, maybe some who are cheating. There is something wonderful about an organ that is eating itself alive, and that if you come back, like Bond comes back from dealing with whatever, you know, the Inuit gun insane or something, right? He comes back from some great Bond film-like thing 
on the outside to that, where everything is going to hell in a handbag. That's where I would, that's where I go. I'd go in on itself. You know, all these meetings you have with M and, you know, talking about the, the, the scotch and you know, these big rooms and panel and wood with, you know, people's shields and you know, all that, all of that. But bring it down. So the great about Smiley's, you know, that little room they always met in. The circus always met in. It was kind of like this condensed version of the, of the meat hall, right? And sort of like the bourbon hall or something, right? I would go there. That's all. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a great idea. I think that the modern bomb films are a bit scared to go small scale. I think they they all just want to go bombastic and have right. Daniel Craig charging through walls, which is fun. But there's other stuff in the spy universe other than just martinis. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 the, in the Ossenberg one, they come back with a German professor named Valen who was supposedly defecting from Vichy, France, just during World War II. Mm -hmm. And he's been studying reverse continuity. So it's like our introduction in that series. Um, hopefully we're going to move forward with it. Uh, to the madness of simple science. And what he does is he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's part of a plot to destroy MI5. And he tries to destroy them with reverse continuity. So what we do with the audience is we introduce this very sort of bureaucratic, cliched, plebeian world of don't forget to sign that six times and don't forget we had to fill out that and triplicate and that stuff with like reverse continuity trying to destroy MI5. <laughs> so I'm trying to wrap my head around that. That's a, that's, a, that's a hell of a Bond film right there. Well, it could be, yes. But I... Hey. You know, there are, this is the problem for me with the Bond film is they never, this is okay. They never quite go far enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's actually interesting. Um, we spoke to uh, Nicholas Meyer uh, some time ago and he said something very similar when he, he pitched a Bond film in the nineties, one of them. And his answer to the, the villain problem was for, for that basically. That that not exactly that pitch different, but in you can kind of see the elements there. It's just interesting. The the creative minds are thinking that. Well, I think the thing is that, that we've been brought up, you know, with uh, you know, what's his name? The, uh, the guy who defected to the Russians. And, you know, we're we're aware of that. And uh, and that's where the most harm can be done. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, we're gonna go set a bomb off in Cleveland. Okay, well, maybe it's a good idea. So but the, the issue is we're going to destroy every foundation that you have for saving the West. That's what's really scary. Right. Okay, so you've talked, you know, about the project you're working on. Is there anything else people should be on the lookout for in the future? Well, I'm doing a wonderful project with uh, Robert Rodriguez, and it's about the Aztec and before the Spanish. It's a, it's a great project. It's Annie's in, and it, it deals with a world that we just don't know. We never, we've never met. Never met. I mean, you know, completely, you know, women were very powerful. They sat in the, the, the Council of Nobles that chose the god, uh, the king. Um, look, Tenochtitlan had zoos, it had uh, aquariums, um, you know, they, they had schools even slaves were required to go to school and the slaves could be emancipated you know against set against this barbaric you know um sacrificial shit that the sacrificial it, it's getting into the depth of that is so much goddamn fun so there's that um i'm also not working on it. there's a couple of things i can't talk about um uh there's a film i'm working on called uh blindsided um that i'm, I'm just handing the script and i'm really proud of it's uh it's about a court case a very simple court case and what i've made it about the relationships i mean it's it's about it's giant in its themes and tiny and profound in its real elements. And um, 
you know, that. Anyway, so I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what the money is? I mean, there's a lot of other stuff that, I'm, that I have on the front and back burner that I'm working on. Um, you know, it's getting them made. For sure. Lafayette is like one of my favorites. Well, I mean, David, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, Jump and Jack Flash was one of the first films that we tackled uh, on this podcast. And I always rate it as a sort of a hidden 80s gem. I think the cast is fantastic. And I think it's a really funny film. And I think the story behind it is also pretty good too. And it turns out that your story was even better. So thank you for enlightening us with this, uh, this information that I don't think anyone knew. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks for uh, giving it a shot. Um, okay, so yeah, thank you, David, for joining us. Thank you very much. All right, yeah. take care. Thanks. Well, that was David Franzoni. It was certainly a gas, gas, gas. <laughs> now, Scott, I put on my spy-like analytical goggles, and I think he may be a history buff. Yeah, I, I think he gave some sly hints. Now, I, I do play a bit of some card games at the casinos. You know, I, I understand tells. And he was showing some tells about his enjoyment of history, specifically English history. Yeah, and I mean, you knew all this, right? Like, this was a lot of stuff that they taught you right in grade school. I mean, the Congolese War is uh, basically, uh, we learned that in what you would call kindergarten. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then we move straight on to Arthurian legends. <laughs> Not the other way around, dude, the way you think it would be. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 well, this is how you end up like me. Right. Completely right. uneducated. <laughs> right. Um, I thought the background that when he talked about the development of Jumpin' Jack Flash was incredible. Like, to hear the real world parallels he was making, the uh, thought that went behind all of the decisions in a movie that I think a lot of people would have seen maybe on TV in the afternoon and thought, oh, you know, it's a silly Whoopi Goldberg film, whatever. Um, it was fascinating just to hear how much uh, thought and research was being done in terms of setting up that story. And uh, we've been blessed to talk to quite a few screenwriters so far, and we've got some more coming up down the line. And it's really interesting just to hear how these stories start off and then they get put through the meat grinder that is Hollywood and then you get a completely different thing at the end. It's like the whole chicken McNuggets. You know, it starts off as an actual chicken and ends up as a pink blob. Yeah. And this was David's first film, you know, first produced um, screenplay. And so not a lot of power there. Like when you have worked on Gladiator and you're a producer on Gladiator and you write the screenplay for that film, that's something that once you're being attached to projects, they go, oh, whoa, okay, the writer of Gladiator, fair enough. Um, even then, you're probably going to be rewritten in Hollywood. But nonetheless, you have a lot more clout than what he would have had in 1980, probably five or four when he is, um, you know, writing the screenplay for Jumpin' Jack Flash. And I, I actually rewatched Jumpin' Jack Flash. So I've now watched it a grand total of three times for this podcast. Go me. Um, to just re you know, refresh my memory about the film. And it was interesting to ask him about, like, how the characters started off. Because, it well, firstly, it wasn't a comedy. Yeah, well... It was open to interpretation as a comedy. <laughs> sure. Some people thought it was funny. And I, I get the whole office setting being quite funny. I, I've worked in offices before. They can be hilarious at times. But, you know, life isn't a series of skits. Mm. And so I understand where he was coming from with that angle. Um, but, you know, the whole idea of Terry Doolittle had a boyfriend. Yeah. Um, which uh, sort of evolved into the Stephen Collins character, I guess. Uh, seems like it anyway we talked about i think we talked about with that film that it had a lot of the elements of like the 80s fairy tale um which is so many movies of that era where they have that kind of sort of the um the romantic element uh very like um you know rom-com type of setup that kind of pays off in a fairy tale ending which is what jumping jack flash does with the jonathan price character and you just kind of get the sense like that sort of um, almost fantasy-like rom-com element wasn't really there initially. Yeah, and, and one thing we also touched on that I found interesting was just the ending. O originally, the Terry Doolittle character, Whoopi Goldberg's inevitable character, um, does meet Jack at the airport at the end. But like I, from what I could tell what he said, it was like you would almost see them in the distance. You don't really have an exchange between the two. Mm. Whereas in reality, we got this uh, strange scene uh of uh 
of Jonathan Price talking to Whoopi Goldberg from one side of the room using their computers that show video. And then a very creepy Jonathan Price walking up behind Whoopi Goldberg and stroking her face. Uh, that's still uh, that still creeped me out even on the third watch, I have to say. <laughs> and it's not just that it's Jonathan Price who doesn't really fit the bill in terms of what uh, you know, Mr. Franzoni was talking about um, in terms of how he saw the character, but it's the fact I'll take that-, that back. He's a warrior. <laughs> He's a champion. Yeah. It's that when he shows up, He's in no way threatening and he's not mysterious. Like he's wearing this sort of dorky orange 80s vest. Is it? Yeah. Right. And um, there's nothing like um, there's no mystique to that image. It's a very kind of he looks like a guy who would just be on the street. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like an average Joe. And his whole concept behind the Jack characters that you build up this image in your mind of this guy who's seen things he's been through things he's in trouble he needs help but you know he's a he's a capable soldier nonetheless and so you would expect you know a 80s action star maybe maybe sliced alone or something to walk up and be like hey i'm jack <laughs> hey, oh and then um yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i mean, I mean that would have made the computer voice very different <laughs> i have to say <laughs> um he cited Steve McQueen as an example of what he had in mind. And I was like racking my brain because I, I feel like, did we have that many Steve McQueen types in the 80s? I think maybe like Harrison Ford is the closest to that. Um, but even then, Steve McQueen had a real like hard living kind of style to him as well. Like it's that world weary kind of look. And I don't know if there's many actors who jumped to my mind when he said that. I wondered even if you'd use more of a character actor almost like a gene hackman or something i don't know what's worse gene hackman or jonathan price well uh, who, who do you want stroking your head <laughs> well is gene hackman um doing it as lex luther from the superman film that's okay <laughs> yes yeah it's, it's full lex luther bald gene hackman although he was only bald in like one scene because he wouldn't shave his head for the yeah. movie yeah, yeah yeah um i think i'd choose jonathan price just because uh I love Jonathan Price. From everything I've heard, he's a nicer man. <laughs> Gene Hackman, a little prickly, I think. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it was just a fascinating exploration of what could have been mm-hmm. with the film and also a celebration of what was good about the film. I think you know a lot of the strong story beats the film had came from his original idea. Um, and he said, you know, the comedy was just sort of added on top. And you can really see that in the film. There are sections where it's basically played straight and then Whoopi will make a joke, but that's not really the story. That's just Whoopi making a joke about the the scenario. Um, And so that you can see how that was just like icing on a cake, basically. I'm not saying it was a great cake. It's not a knock list cake, but a cake. Sure. Um, A cake that Ray Milland would really enjoy um, in the adventures of ministry of fear. Um, Yes. What a Uh, connection. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Um, But also that when you watch jumping Jack flash, um, you know, the comedy is hit or miss depending on, you know, where you sit. You may find the movie not funny at all, but the spy plot holds up fairly well. Like the dots are connected. When you get to the end, it feels like you've more or less watched a cohesive, um, somewhat complicated spy story. Um, and he had issues with it being a spot, you know, seeing this as a spy film. That's fine. I think for the purposes of this podcast, it falls into the spy film kind of genre. So we're going we're gonna to bend for that one. But um, it felt like in terms of what he would have set up initially, at least, that there was a foundation there in terms of a spy, a, a spy narrative. And then obviously we also spoke about some of his uh, other notable works. Uh, you spoke to him about Army Star, a film I haven't seen yet, but I've, I've put it on my list to catch up on. Uh, did you Did you garner any information from that that you liked? Yeah, it was a movie that I saw it back when it, you know, first hit video. I didn't see it in theaters, um, but it had the misfortune of opening um, during the Titanic craze. So, like, Ah. Amistad was very overlooked. Um, You know, it was nominated for a few Oscars. Anthony Hopkins got a supporting actor, but it didn't get a best picture, best director, best screenplay, anything like that. In a different year, it might have squeaked in. It is viewed as something of a lesser Spielberg, but it's during that era where Spielberg is still making great stuff consistently. So it's 
only being held up in comparison to some of the other movies of that era, especially Schindler's List, which a lot of people at the time saw as it sort of being the next in line of sort of the more serious Spielberg history-based narratives. And it doesn't measure up to Schindler's List, which is one of the great films of its time. But watching it last night for the first time in, you know, over 20 years, I was really drawn into, there's so many sequences that just show Spielberg's mastery of visual storytelling. And the movie has a very difficult balance. Um, And it's something I touched on in the interview in that when you look at Gladiator, when you look at Jumpin' Jack Flash, they have very clear protagonists that you follow through the movie. The story of Amistad is very complex. There are so many characters throughout the film, but he has to keep the focus on the Jaiman Hansu um, main character of the story. Like, how do you build all of these complicated events being driven by all these other actors, um, but still keep it focused on your main character? And I thought that was really interesting to hear him talk about. Yeah, it, it's certainly given me a, an extra push to go watch the film. So I, I'm glad for that. And we, of course, touched on, you know, the film he won an Oscar for, for best film, which is Gladiator. Uh, and it, That's probably in my top 10 films of all time. Yeah, it was great to hear him talk about his collaborations with Ridley Scott, someone who I just don't hear a lot of um, screenwriters talk about um, Ridley Scott being someone that necessarily invested in narrative versus more of the visual world and storytelling. So it was really fascinating to hear him kind of back up and say that, you know, Ridley Scott really has a very strong storytelling sense. Then I think it's quite clear from their collaboration that it at least really came across in Gladiator. And I'm glad that, you know, coming on from Jumpin' Jack Flash and having his story kind of kind of chewed up a little bit, changed, that later on with his films that he's done since, he was able to stay with the production longer and, and, and help guide it to their to its goal and obviously it's worked for him Mm -hmm. he's got an oscar not every screenwriter can say that yeah yeah because yeah i mean producing gladiator was a great great thing for him and the fact that he was a producer on gladiator ensured a certain amount of creative control yeah um but yeah i i think overall it was a great chat i I learned a ton about jumping jack flash i i still enjoy it i don't think um it would make the knock list uh, looking back on it again but uh it's certainly an interesting uh piece of work for its time it certainly feels like his 80s film and it's um maybe a bit of a hidden gem i think if you haven't seen jump and jack flash and you like spy comedies it's actually quite fun i would i would again say check it out the world of spy comedies is riddled with landmines that we are going to be setting off as we continue down this journey so um i agree like i think jump and jack flash even if you don't find it that funny necessarily there's conceptual things that I think are much more interesting than a lot of the other movies we're going to tackle that are like, what if James Bond was stupid? You know, we're going to run into a lot of those types of movies. Whereas this one felt like it had an angle on an original premise that a lot of the other films won't. Well, what if James Bond was stupid? I think you speak to him every week about spy movies. Hello. (laughs) But I'm the Felix Leiter and I'm also stupid. (laughs) (laughs) You're the Jack Lord version with the sunglasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, again, thank you all for listening. Don't forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners... Oh, sorry, the, the British National Anthem is playing. I have to stand up. See you.